Well, I hope you enjoyed your lunch, your dessert. And I did want to say when I introduced Mark, I wanted to make sure I recognize his son, David, who is a fellow in our Mies Center. And if you get a chance to look at Daily Signal, I think from yesterday, he had an article about uh, overcriminalization. So we're very proud of David. Very, very, very good job that he's doing down the Mies Center. Had a chance to visit with him. And I know you're all very proud. Um, as I mentioned, David and I got a chance to visit a little bit about his talk, and uh, I was very happy that I got the draw to introduce David because he does indeed make everyone look good around him, and, uh, and that makes it easier for me. Yes, David is the director of the uh, Kenneth Simon Center for Principal Politics and Heritage Foundation's AWC Foundation Fellow, but there's much more than that to David, as you all know. David's got that unique ability to frame an issue in a way that is both provocative and understandable at the same time. That's pretty tough to do, but David threads that needle. He's so effective, and for this reason, very effective at communicating with audience, particularly on college campuses. And uh, that's a challenge nowadays, as we know. Have you ever had the experience, though, when um, you've had a thought or an idea about something, but you couldn't put it into words, and then somebody comes along and does that? Right? If you're a Limbaugh fan, for example, and you agree with something he says, you might say, what? Ditto, Ditto right? Now, David's French-Canadian, okay? Now, if you're, say it in French, ditto might mean something else, David. I'm not quite sure. What would, how would you say ditto in French? Ditto. Uh, oh, goodness. <laughs> Le Manchu. All right. Well, I think it's going to take a while for lemon shoe heads to outdo <laughs> ditto heads for a while, but we're going to work on it right here. We're going to start it right here today. So with that, what I'd like us for all to do is give David a warm welcome up to the stage right now. David, thank you for coming. And Okay, lemon shoes, so that, is that it? We've agreed? Uh, thank you, Brett, for that very generous introduction. It's very nice to be here. I was having a lot of fun until they showed that video, which got me a little bit worried, because I take the lesson to be is we should turn to Canada for guidance. And if we do that on healthcare, I don't think it's gonna work out all that well, so. Uh, I hope it only applies to skating rings. So we're gonna talk about Trumpism and conservatism today, which is a very difficult subject to tackle, because I've come to realize in the past few months that it is almost impossible to say anything about our current president without offending or upsetting someone, uh, even when you're talking to heritage donors. So I thought that I would begin by making a non-controversial claim. Donald Trump is a controversial figure. <laughs> and as such, he gets a lot of attention. Too much, in my estimation. The press, in particular, has been obsessed with him ever since he pulled off what is, without a doubt, the greatest electoral upset in American political history. They follow his every move, and they report feverishly on his every tweet. His ideas, as a result, haven't received the attention they deserve. What I would call Trumpism, that I define as the political lens through which Donald Trump looks at the world, remains a somewhat nebulous idea in the minds of most. Conservatives, in particular, remain unsure what to make of it. To put the matter bluntly, is this a hostile takeover of the Republican Party to which we've laid claim since the Reagan era? Or does this represent, perhaps, an allied political force that can be managed and absorbed? In my brief remarks today, I propose to do two things. First of all, to define Trumpism so that we know what we're talking about. Second, and this is my argument, I think that Trumpism and conservatism should fuse, that they should go together. To put it in different terms, I think that conservatism needs a good dose of Trumpism, but I also think that Trumpism needs a good dose of conservatism. And that I think that America, the Republican Party, and the right would be much better off if we took the best elements of each one and combined them. That's my premise today. Now, in framing it this way, of course, I open myself up to two obvious objections, one from the right and one from the left. The objection from the right, if you read the chattering classes in Washington, D.C., is that there is no such thing as Trumpism. 
All there is is Donald Trump the man, whose mind is filled with an incoherent mishmash of half-baked conspiracy theories, barely digested ideas, and various simple-minded slogans he's picked up along the way. Uh, the Onion recently uh, had a little story, that the title of which I thought was pretty amusing. They said that Trump reassures the nation that he decided to bomb Syria after, le after carefully considering all his passing whims. <laughs> I think this is incorrect. Uh, if you read his speeches, if you follow him in the past two years, so he formally announced in June of 2015, but he started campaigning softly in January of 2015 at the South Carolina Tea Party Convention, uh, you start to realize that there's a coherent core set of ideas that run through all of his speeches. In other words, I think it's possible, I think it's necessary to separate the wheat, the core substantive ideas that define the worldview, from the chaff, the heckles, the provocative statements, the careless tweets. I think that the beginning of wisdom, if you want to understand Trumpism, is to adopt the following rule. If Trump says it once, ignore it. I therefore don't think it's a core pillar of Trumpism that we should punish women who get abortions, or that we should blame the JFK assassination on Rafael Cruz. I think you can set these things aside. The other objection, of course, to having a talk on Trumpism comes from the left. They would say, why do you need to define it? We all know what Trumpism is. It's ethno-nationalism. It's white nationalism, or to put it in simpler terms, it's the rebirth of Nazi fascism in America. This is the rhetoric they've adopted. I think this is an idiotic statement beyond belief. There is much to criticize about Donald Trump, but the claim that he's a white nationalist is completely unsubstantiated. Not once in the entirety of the campaign did he imply, much less say, that America at its core is a white nation. Reread his inaugural address, you'll find the following line. When you open your heart to patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. I've read Mein Kampf. I guarantee he didn't take it from there. If anything, that sounds like <laughs> something Obama could say. So what then is Trumpism? I would define Trumpism as being constituted of three pillars. First of all, it's a way of looking at how America relates to other countries. This is the America first nationalism. Second, it's a way of looking at our domestic policy, uh, domestic politics. This is the populism. And third, it's a temperament that is bold, aggressive, and confrontational. Allow me to unpack the first one. The setting for Trumpism is a world of competing nation states with divergent interests that clash against one another. And the promise of Trumpism, as he put it time and time again during the campaign, is we are in competition with the world and I want America to win. Donald Trump doesn't delude himself into thinking that there is a global community of nations working in harmony to address the joint challenges of the 21st century. <laughs> He, he sees the world as Hobbes and Thucydides saw it. Nations competing against one another for material gain, and this is very important, also for glory. As he said during the campaign, we proudly defend America at every single turn. America will get the respect it deserves. This, by the way, I think is the way to understand what just happened in Syria. So if you listen to the chattering classes in Washington, this is the rebirth of George Bush's foreign policy uh, a la Trump because he lobbed 59 Tomahawk missiles into Syria. That's not what it is. This is a way of saying, when America draws a red line, we enforce it. It's a way of vindicating our honor. The first pillar of Trumpism then is defending America's national interest in this global competition against other nations. And this explains Trump's position on the three signature issues of trade, immigration, and foreign policy. The common denominator to all three is that America should come first. Actually, that's mistaken. That Americans should come first. That our interest, our well-being, our values should be the leading consideration when determining how we interact with other nations on the issues of trade, immigration, and foreign policy. Second, if you turn to our domestic politics, so not how we look at other countries, but how Trump looks at the country domestically, 
Trumpism is populist, by which I mean it doesn't look at politics through the usual left versus right ideological prism, but rather through a sociological top versus down prism. The core contention of Trumpism, as it applies to our domestic politics, is that the American people have been betrayed and screwed over by corrupt and incompetent elites from both parties. Trumpism posits that the fundamental divide in America is not race, is not gender, is not religion, it's not even class in the way that Bernie Sanders it, understands it. It's not about how much money you make. It's class understood as a shared worldview and access to power of the ruling elites. Let me give you an example. If you make $40,000 a year scribbling for the New York Times, according to Trump, you are part of the ruling class. If you make $2 million a year selling tires in Omaha and going to church and clinging to your guns and your religion, according to Sanders, you are part of the ruling class because you're in the top 1%. According to Trump, you're not because you're not close to power and you don't share the worldview of the elites. The fundamental divide then for Trump is the ruling class, which includes big business, big media, big government, big donors, special interests, which by the way, he thinks are found in both parties. And then on the other side of the divide, he's resurrected a line from FDR and he calls the American people the forgotten men and women of this country. There's a very important implication here, by the way, that I want to touch upon, but that I'll return to is, if you look at our politics this way, one implication is that the government is not necessarily the bad guy. The question for Trump is not big government versus small government, limited government versus whatever it is. It's, is the government working for the people or against the people? Now, conservatives can be reassured that Trump realizes that the bulk of the modern administrative state has been captured by the ruling class and therefore is not advancing the interests of the American people. That said, he has no principled hostility to government programs if he thinks they are helping the American people. Hence the openness to a trillion dollar infrastructure bill, hence the refusal, at least on the campaign trail, to reforming our entitlements. Third, and this flows naturally from this, if you believe that the world is composed of clashing nations, and if you think that we have some sort of a cold civil war going on in the country, then naturally your approach to this will be feisty, aggressive, bold, manly, and confrontational. Trumpism is not polite, it is not timid, and it is not accommodationist. This explains, by the way, the stance on PC that I think is a huge misnomer. PC to me means, do you teach Maya Angelou or Shakespeare in Intuit to College English? What we're dealing with is a form of intellectual tyranny that is fundamentally incompatible with Republican self-government because it silences any debate by accusing people of bigotry if they raise any point. And what Trump has shown to his immense credit is that it takes two to PC. One to hurl the accusation and the other to fold like a lawn chair. And Trump has shown <laughs> that the left is only as strong as we allow them to be on these issues. That I think in a nutshell is Trumpism. An America first foreign policy, trade policy and immigration policy, how we relate to other countries, a populist, a populist view of our domestic politics and then a bold, aggressive, confrontational approach in dealing with America's perceived enemies abroad and at home. Now, what does this mean for conservatism? Well, if I'm correct in my definition, I think that there are two obvious areas in which we conservatives need a good dose of Trumpism. The first one is, we have become so enamored with ideas, with the idea that ideas have consequences, as Richard Weaver put it, that I think we've lost sight of one of the basic rules of politics, that in politics, it's primarily about interests. This is something that the Democrats understand very, very well. They go through all the groups that make up the Rainbow Coalition, and they make quite clear what they're going to give them. Listen to Pocahontas' acceptance speech when she got the Senate seat in Massachusetts in 2012. She goes through all of the constituencies of the Democratic Party and says, here's what I'm going to give you. This, I'd like to remind you, is something that our founders understood. Reread James Madison, Federalist 10. He says that the principal task of modern legislation is to regulate the various competing interests in society. Conservatives and Republicans, however, seem to have forgotten that lesson. 
Either we blather on about abstractions and ideas endlessly, or if we speak of the interests, it's always the interest, as Romney did in his failed campaign, of businessmen and entrepreneurs. I have no hostility to either one, but need I remind you that most Americans are not entrepreneurs and are not about to launch a startup. Ideas matter. Ideas shape interest. Heck, if ideas didn't matter, I'd be out of a job. But once you enter the public square, when you deal in politics, you have to connect your ideas to interest. And this is a good reminder for conservatives. Second, I think that Trumpism is a good course corrective for a conservatism on the whole that is too dogmatically libertarian in its economic thinking, too unrepentantly neoconservative in its foreign policy thinking, and too deferential to the US Chamber of Commerce and the Wall Street Journal in its immigration thinking. Trumpism is a way to reassert the primacy of the national interest in all three of these realms, or rather to redefine it in better terms. And in this regard, it's a gentle nudge for a conservatism that to some extent has lost true north on these positions. Now, in saying this, I readily concede that there is much in Trumpism at the level of policy that is controversial and even mistaken, but I think that the broad thrust is correct. Which brings me now to, I think, the areas in which Trumpism needs a good dose of conservatism. First of all, Trumpism is kind of thin on ideas. I think Trump, the big picture is good, but the more granular you go, the more you find bad ideas or no ideas. We saw this on display a few weeks ago. Look, repeal and replace is a fantastic campaign slogan. I know because we message tested it at Heritage and it resonates very well with voters. Here's the thing, it is not a governing agenda. It doesn't tell you how to repeal and what to replace with. And I think Trump made two mistakes there. First is he trusted Paul Ryan, which he shouldn't have done because his interests don't align with his. And second is he didn't do his homework on, on healthcare policy. And this is an area I think where conservatives can come in and help put some meat on the bone of Trumpism. Second, and I think this will echo what Ryan has said yesterday and will say again this afternoon, Social, conservative is social conservatism is crucially important to the well-being of middle America. And these are not issues that Trumpism emphasizes. Uh, an authentic American populism would speak not only to the material interests of middle America, but also to their spiritual well-being. And if you read a little bit or you travel around in this country, you will see that our fellow Americans are not only hurting economically because their plants are closing, but also because marriage has collapsed amongst lower income Americans. Because there's widespread obesity, opioid addiction. To his credit, Trump has started talking about the last issue. I know of only two political books that Trump has read and that have influenced his thinking. I'm not saying there are not more than two, I'm just saying I only know of two of them. One is Adios America by Ann Coulter, I haven't read it. The other one is Blue Collar Conservative by Rick Santorum, which I've started reading. And on page two of Blue Collar Conservative, conservatism, uh, uh, Santorum says, the greatest threat to the average American achieving his dreams today is a dysfunctional culture. Because the lead spokesman of Trumpism is a secular New Yorker who's on his third marriage, and that's not where the center of gravity is, I think there's an important role for conservatism to remind Trumpism of the importance of the social issues. Third, I think conservatism, and in particular libertarianism, need to remind Trumpism of the dangers of cronyism. It is all well and good to want to protect American workers and to want to help them. Here's the question. How do you avoid putting the government in a position of picking winners and losers? Take the carrier deal, okay? Huge deal, fantastic deal, we all love it. Here's my question. Who decides why carrier gets the $7 million tax breaks and not any one of the others of thousands of companies headquartered in Indiana. Who decides which products get tariffs and which don't? Who decides which industries get protected and which are allowed to go out of business? I don't think Trumpism has sufficiently thought about this. And then lastly, conservatism needs to box Trumpism into a framework of limited constitutional government. To emphasize the role of federalism, for example, there's a tendency in Trump, when he discusses public policy issues, to assume that all of them should be handled at the national level. 
There were strange echoes of Barack Obama in his inaugural address. Obama was fond of saying, by quoting Barney Frank, government is just another word for what we choose to do together. And by government, of course, he always meant the federal government. Trump in the inaugural address, often whenever he said we, not the French we, we, the English we, all of us, tended to equate that with the federal government. And that's not the proper way to approach public policy questions. I will end by saying that how all of this will shake out, I don't know. Whether or not Trumpism and conservatism can fuse together in large part depends on the extent to which Trump can govern successfully, on the extent to which he can implement a successful Trumpist agenda. I just think that it would be a huge mistake for the right to refuse to think that there is something for us to learn there, and conversely, an equally big mistake for Trump and the Trumpists to not listen to conservatives. Thank you.